We're back, ready to go on our teaching session on the doctrine of congregational singing. This is a series that we started some time ago. The text for this particular sermon series is Psalm 96, verses 1, 2, and 3. <clears throat> We've been introduced to this psalm a number of times already. You will notice that it says this, Sing to the Lord a new song. And let me just stop there. That's a command. Bless his name, proclaim good tidings of his salvation. That's also a command. And then verse 3, tell of his glory among the nations. That is also a command. You have these commands here, and these are given as far as congregational singing is concerned. So, if we look at a sermon outline, point number one is singing is commanded by God. And that, of course, is congregational singing. <clears throat> Number two, singing is a means of indoctrination. And thirdly, singing is a means of evangelism. Indoctrination, of course, comes in verse two. This is where we find ourselves in our study. And so let me turn some of the words into red ink or red uh, print so that you can tell where we are in our progress. We are currently under Psalm 96 and verse 2, and right here where it says proclaim. That is where we're at. An outline update. Number one, the purpose for congregational singing is worship. A, the command. B, the command to sing. C, the command's guidelines. Number two, it's a means of indoctrination. We saw this in verse 2. The text says, proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. The key words are closely linked units, and they work like this. Proclaim, which is the word basar. Salvation, which is the word yeshoak. Well, we'll see it a little later today. And then uh, day to day, which is miyom liyom. Our study has taken us, first of all, to the... <clears throat> reshaping of the mind as it pertains to us ourselves and we also have now started to look at how the reshaping of the mind when it refers to our family <clears throat> we um, have looked at two passages of scripture at this time the first one is the command to teach your family by means of song deuteronomy 31 and then Genesis 33, 20, the example or the precedent of the head of the family declaring the family's belief system. And this, of course, as we will see, um, is also done by song. It's also done by song. Our outline forecast, you will see their self, family, and then church. There's the big space between family and church because that is where we are finding ourselves in our study. The command to teach your family by means of song, Deuteronomy 31. Teaching the family requires spiritually strong male leadership. And this is the topic or the theme of our sermon today. And that is that this type of teaching requires a spiritually strong male to be in the leadership position. That means if you have usurped your position as the spiritual leader in your family, you need to take it back. You need to become strong. And you will see that there are examples as to what strong male leadership looks like. The first example is found in Genesis 33, and we see that Jacob builds an altar. The second example is going to be Joshua 24, 15, the very famous words that you sometimes see on plaques in Christian bookstores and in people's homes. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. Though we will not be getting to this point, point number three, uh, we do want to take note that it is coming up, and that is that even when it seems that as a parent you're losing the battle with your children, do not give up. Psalm 89. 
And then Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 20 verses, uh, there's the consistency in teaching which is necessary. So that is where we find ourselves in our study. But more precisely, Genesis 33, and we see that Jacob builds an altar, and there are three subpoints. The first one is Jagir, Sadutha, and Galid, Genesis 31, Paniel, Genesis 32, and then El Elohe Israel, Genesis 33. And uh, then we will move on to <coughs> uh, Joshua 24. But for right now, let's review these three points that we have under Jacob builds an altar. So if you will open your Bibles, you will be able to uh, follow along. Genesis 31, 32, and 33. All right, let's begin with Jagger Sadutha Gali. This is found in verses 34 through 54 of Genesis 31. So let me uh, first give you some points, and then we can take a look at that, at that chapter. But uh, first and foremost, <clears throat> There's a pile of stones, and uh, that pile of stones was named Jagger, Sadutha, and Galid. A pile of stones was or became a memorial or became a memorial of a decision made by the heads of two families. And on your screen, you should be able to see two people who are uh, giving each other a hand by stacking rocks or stacking stones. And so at this time, I would like for you to open your Bibles to Genesis 31, please. Okay, we want to take a look <clears throat> at verses 34 through 54. The background of the story is that Jacob has left Laban's uh, home area in Padam Aram, and he is... Uh, looking to go back to his uh, own homeland, Canaan. But unbeknownst to him, his wife has taken the teraphim, which are the household idols. And uh, Laban has hotly pursued him in order to get them back. The idea is that the people who have those household idols are the ones who are going to receive the inheritance of the family or the, the wealth, the treasure, the legacy of that family. Underlying that is the fact that these particular gods would guarantee you that blessing. So um, right off the bat, you should be able to tell that uh, this wife that Jacob had uh, was not, shall we say, as good of a Christian as we would have her to be. But uh, Jacob loved her and he uh, protected her in so many different ways. So Laban, the father of Rachel, comes and creates a uh, search situation. And that creates a situation in which Jacob, the head of his family, is at loggerheads with Laban, the head of his family. And unbeknown to Jacob, his wife has actually committed that crime. So we need to begin to... Uh, get to that place. Let me begin to read at verse 32. I'll put it at the top of the screen. And this is what it says. The, Jacob is speaking here, and he's speaking to Laban. And uh, he says, The one <coughs> with whom you find your God shall not live. So here the head of the family is putting his foot down. He is uh, exerting his authority. Uh, proving, or you might even say he's pumping his chest out in the presence uh, of Laban and all the other family members. And so he says, point out what is yours amongst my belongings and take it for yourself. For Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. Please notice that the Bible makes it quite clear that Rachel did a dishonest thing here. She stole the household idols. 
So Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the tent of the two maids, that is, the two surrogate mothers, but he did not find the household idol. Then he went out to Leah's tent and entered Rachel's tent. And this is where our citation begins at verse 34. Now Rachel had taken the household idols and put them in the camel's saddle and sat on them. And Laban fell through all of the tent, but did not find them. She said to her father, verse 35, let me get it up here. She said to her father, Father, let not my Lord be angry that I cannot rise before you, for the manner of women is upon me. So he searched, but he did not find the household idols. Now, there is a point of commentary here that could be made, and that is that it's not an unusual thing that women should use their feminine cycle in order to excuse certain behaviors. It is as old as the hills. And here is Rachel who was doing it, and it isn't like it had never happened before because she learned that trick from somebody. Verse 36, Then Jacob became angry and contended with Laban, and Jacob said to Laban, What's my transgression and what is my sin that you have hotly pursued me? Though you have felt through all my goods, what have you found of all of your household goods? Set it here before my kinsmen and your kinsmen that they may decide between us two. In other words, <clears throat> Jacob is saying, Okay, you've come accusing me of, of theft. Put on this table what you say that I have stole, and my relatives will see it, your relatives will see it, and it'll be right here. And then Jacob goes on to say, now that we're talking about stealing, let me tell you some things that I can't put on a table. And then it starts at, at verse 38. Twenty years I have been with you. Uh, your ewes and your female goats have not mis miscarried, nor have I eaten the rams of your flock. And so he starts to say, Look, I have worked hard for you. You can't put that on the table. But I work really hard. Verse 41, he goes on to say, These 20 years I have been in your house. I served you 14 years for your two daughters, six years for your flock, and you changed my wages 10 times. Verse 42, and you'll see that I've highlighted it right there. If God, the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been for me, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God has seen my affliction and the toil of my hands, so he rendered judgment last night. I won't comment too much on verse 42, but I want you to notice that here Jacob is beginning to acknowledge that God is showing him grace despite the fact that he doesn't really deserve it he says that god has seen my affliction that is the worry the way that i've been eating myself inside out and the toil of my hands i have worked and worked and worked for you so he rendered judgment last night and that has to be the dream that laban had then laban replied to jacob the daughters are my daughters and the children are my children, and the flocks are my flocks, and all that you see is mine. But what can I do this day to these my daughters, or to their children whom they have borne? In other words, in verse 43, Laban is recognizing that though he had the right of the patriarch of the ancient world to claim these children and these daughters as his, he realizes that he would just make them unhappy. And so here is a clue to those of you who are fathers, and that is that there will be times when even though you feel in your heart that you're right and your daughter is wrong, and remember, nothing can be as forceful as a young adult woman, a teenage girl, who puts her foot down and says, no, I won't. And so Laban in verse 43 is saying, I'm going to let this go. 
I thought that you guys had stolen things from me, but obviously you haven't. And so there is, shall we say, a scrap of righteousness in your decision, and I will let you guys go. Verse 44, so now come and let us make a covenant. So Laban is proposing a covenant that is a contract and agreement between himself and Jacob. You and I, verse 44, and let it be a witness between you and me. So this is a contract that is going to be made, but unlike the contract that was made earlier between Laban and Jacob, where the wages were changed ten times, where Jacob got tricked into marrying the wrong wife, and uh, he had to work a total of twenty years, this time, they're going to settle it. They're going to sign on the dotted line. Now, they didn't have a piece of paper to sign. And so, they are going to make a witness between you and me, verse 44. Now, for those of you who are not very old, even in our country, we have what is known as a witness tree or a witness uh, button. A witness tree is a tree that divides one county from another. And that becomes the, the, the marker that divides land, real estate, and so that's called the witness tree. Surveyors put spikes or buttons into the earth or even into a sidewalk. You can find them sometimes when you're walking along the street. There will be this very big, well, I won't say very big, but um, a spike with a head on it that is maybe two to three inches in diameter. And it is there because it tells the surveyor this is where this plot of land ends, the next plot begins. It gives so many things. That is called a witness marker. And so, this is what Laban is proposing here in verse 44. Let's make a covenant between you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. So, verse 45, then Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. Please take a look. Jacob takes a stone and sets it up as a pillar. Jacob said to his kinsmen, gather stones. So they took stones and they made a heap and they ate there by the heap. Now, let me get verse 46 up toward the top of the screen so you can see it. And verse 46. And now I'm going to highlight something with a kind of a gold color. Okay. And they ate there by the heap. Can you see that? When you are making a pledge, when you are making a contract, when you are declaring something, it is part of the formality to share a meal. And when you share that meal, you are breaking down all of the barriers between the two parties so that you are saying we are now one we are on the same page. We have the same objectives. We have this agreement. We do this when we observe the Lord's Supper. He says, do this in remembrance of me. We are agreeing with the Lord that the bread is his person and that it was perfect and that he was qualified to be our Redeemer, our Savior. We take the cup, 
And we say this is the new covenant in his blood. We are eating a meal. It's a ceremonial meal because it is a meal by which we endorse our agreement. So verse 46, Jacob said to his kinsmen, gather stones. So they took stones and made a heap. Now you see where it says they made a heap? Yes, it was a heap. The picture here is that this heap had enough of ground around it where they could set up, shall we call it a table? Like the Lord's table. It was a table where they could all sit around and be one happy family. Verse 47. Now Laban called it Jegar Sachdutha, but Jacob called it Galid. Jacob called it Galid. Laban said, This heap is a witness between you and me this day. Therefore, it was named Galeed. Verse 48 does not clarify matters very much for our English language. But Laban said, quote, This heap is a witness between you and me this day. That is what the word Galeed means. This is for a witness. Now, verse 48 ends with a comma. And apparently when they divided the Bible, or when they versified the Bible into verses, they divided 48 and 49, and they should be together. Because it should say, Therefore it was named Galid and Mizpah. For he, that's Laban, said, May the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent from one another. Galid? is a witness between you and me. In other words, this is the monument. But then the word mispah gets thrown in there. Mispah. And mispah is the Hebrew for watchtower. And the idea is that God would sit on top of that pile of rocks and make sure that the peace was upheld by both parties. May the Lord watch, because he sits on the mispah between you and me, when we are absent from one another, so that the peace would be held between the two of them, despite the, the fact that they are in different geographical locations, and that each one was keeping up their end of the deal. The deal. Verse 50, if you mistreat my daughters, that's part of the deal, or if you take wives besides my daughters, Although no man is with us, look, God is witness between you and me. In other words, be faithful to my daughters. Laban said to Jacob, Behold this heap, and behold the pillar which I have set between you and me. This heap is a witness, and the pillar is a witness that I will not pass by this heap to you for harm, and you will not pass by this heap and this pillar to me for harm. So here you have this agreement that is taking place. Now, you might say, well, that just seems such a, a odd thing that would happen. So let me show you something. Okay, B prime, this pile of stones was a memorial of a decision made by the heads of two families. Who were they? Laban and Jacob. But you know, this is not that unusual. This pile of stones was more clearly defined by the name Galid and Mizpah. That is a heap of witness and watchtower. Now let me refer you to Nocnernia in Ireland. Now what is Nocnernia? Well, if you notice in the image at the bottom center of your screen, there is a man who is hiking along a trail, and he is going toward, you probably can't see this, but this is the biggest pile of rocks in the world. It's called Nocnarnia. It's in Ireland. Now, on the left, lower left side of your screen, you have a map of the island of Ireland. 
with the red triangle pointing to where this pile of rocks is located because you can go there today and see it. And I'm bringing this up because as the leadership of a family, you not only have the right, but you have the authority and the responsibility to protect your family. And you do this by setting down stones of witness. That requires a strong male leadership. Pile of stones. The English word for this is cairns. Was the site of a family meal. Not only did they make a pile of stones, but they had a meal there, a ceremonial meal. Now let me tell you why this is important. Because today, you and your home, you can have a family meal. As the father, you can proclaim, this is when our family will eat together. Now I know that we're kind of lax in our uh, 20... Um, 23, but um, families used to eat every night together. Nowadays, if you can get one night a week, you seem to be lucky. So, as a father, I am encouraging you as your pastor to set up a pile of stones and make that the family table where the family eats together. Now, you can see in the lower left hand corner of your screen that there's the father the wife and there's two children and obviously there must be a mother-in-law whose mother that is we don't know doesn't matter what matters is that the father is the head of this family and that they're all sharing a meal together because they belong together number one the father convenes the meal. He's the one that says, we are going to eat together at 6 o'clock you know, in the evening, every day, or in today's culture, on Sunday or on Saturday or something like that. Secondly, the father prays at the table, and thus he establishes his, the legitimacy of his lordship of the home. He is the Lord of his castle. He is the head of his family. If he doesn't pray, he is saying, I'm not the head of this family. But if he prays, he is saying, I am one of the, the links in the chain of command. There's God above me, then there's me, and then there's you. So men, learn to pray. Take the authority into your hands and utilize it for good. Number three, the family participates for the meal. Now, what this means is that no member of the family says, I got a note from the doctor says that I'm excused. Or, I don't feel like eating with you guys because I'm mad at you. No. You sit at the table and you eat with us because you are part of this family. And if your soul is in turmoil because of some disagreement that you have, the whole family knows, and you are sharing that pain with us, and we're sharing it with you. Do not allow your family to be fragmented because of some immature, juvenile, emotional eruption. Okay, so this is Genesis 31. Now we come to the next section, and this is the section found in Genesis chapter 32. Peniel, another Hebrew word which means the face of God. This is where Jacob wrestles with the Lord, Genesis 32, verses 22 to 32. Jacob recognizes his need and dependence of God. In other words, Jacob learns the lesson of grace orientation. He needs the grace of God to go from step one to step two. Yes, God told him to go back to Canaan where he's going to be blessed. But you know what? He needs the grace of God to be able 
to join once again with his twin brother who swore to kill him 20 years before. Even though you're under the grace of God, you still need more and more grace because day to day, every day develops a certain barrier and you need the grace of God to get through it. Now it is in this wrestling match or at the end of this combat that Jacob's name is changed to Israel. Jacob becomes Israel which means a prince with God. And so this name is so significant because it means that here is a person who, when he was wrestling with the Lord, would not let him go until he blessed him. In other words, I don't want to be separated from you. I want your blessing. That's grace. And so, Peniel, I have seen the face of God and lived. Letter D, D prime. Jacob names the site of the fight as Peniel, the face of God. Naming that place memorializes a spiritual milestone in Jacob's life. Now, hear me out here, because a strong, Spiritual male leadership requires that you divulge to your family your spiritual growth. And when you take a step, you need to divulge that to your family. Now, I know that there are some people who will say, doesn't that uncover my vulnerability? Uh, well, uh, yes. But your vulnerability is covered by the grace of God. It's like the Apostle Paul said, My grace is sufficient for you. Because, why? Because my weakness is made strong in his grace. Number two, Jacob is now embracing grace orientation. Grace orientation, it first of all begins, shall we say, by salvation. You're saved by grace. It is then augmented in that he gives you grace to live day by day. He provides for you your provisional needs. And then that grace is augmented once again by giving you greater grace when some type of situation happens in your life where you look to him and you say, I need your special grace at this time. And this is what he says in James 4, 6. He gives more grace. Jacob is going to manifest his spiritual advance. He is advancing spiritually. He's on his way and he is going to manifest this to his family. How is he going to do this? Answer. El Elohe Israel. It's at this point in the life that Jacob starts acting like a prince with God. And he is that prince that came out of that place that he called Peniel. He builds an altar and he names it, quote, God, the mighty one of Israel. In other words, he is my God and because of his grace, he is the mighty one. He gets the job done. I can't get the job done. He can get the job done. El Elohe Israel. And you know what? He uses his new name. He uses the name Israel, Prince with God. Jacob uses his new name to show that he has taken an advance in his spiritual life and everyone, including his family, is going to know it. 
Okay. Where is the first time that he mentions this? It is mentioned when he meets his brother Esau. He offers Esau gifts. We see this in verses 1 through 11 in, in chapter 33. Esau indicates that the animosity has subsided by offering to caravan with him home. In other words, let's travel together. Verses 12 through 16. What a fantastic situation this is. Jacob decides that he is going to take residence in Succoth instead of being right on Esau's doorstep. He's going to be a little separated from him. Verses 17 through 20. Okay. Where Esau lives, where Jacob lives in Succoth, it is all the land of Canaan. So Jacob is fulfilling the promise that God has given him by living in Canaan. Jacob buys a piece of land. We find this in verse 19. Jacob constructs an altar and he calls it El Elohe Israel, verse 20, which is our verse. When he buys this piece of land, this appears to be a symbolic act in which Jacob declares that the land is his according to the promise of God. He buys it for a hundred kesitas. The kesita may have been a piece of silver or gold of a certain weight. And according to Gesinius, it was equal to the value of a lamb. Jacob constructs an altar and he calls it El Elohe Israel, God, the Mighty One is the God of Israel. The erecting uh, altar, uh, the erecting of altars with particular names also appears in Exodus seventeen fifteen, where Moses calls his altar Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner. So it's not an unusual thing that that would happen. In thankfulness to God for the good hand of his providence, that is grace, he did not content himself with verbal acknowledgement of God's favor to him, but also made a material one that had profound implications. He built an altar. The implications of building an altar. Setting up the altar indicates who the head of the family is. Jacob is the head of the family. He is over his wives, his children, and his servants. Jacob, with all his imperfections, gives us the example that the father of the family is the head of that family. And so I want to address you men who are listening to me now. I don't care what imperfections you have. God has constituted you the head of the family. And you say, well, doesn't that mean that uh, uh, my decisions could be bad because they will be entirely made of my own decision making? Well, it could be. But the biggest, bigger implication is that since God has constituted you the head of the family, you better get up to speed and be the spiritual head of the family. As the head of the family, you set up the environment for the spiritual growth of the family. So that becomes one of your jobs. You have a wife. You have children. Make your home spiritually friendly or friendly to gro spiritual growth. That means that many of your attitudes and conducts have to be changed so that your wife and your children can feel comfortably, can feel comfortable in showing their own spiritual growth, their own 
advances in the spiritual life. And that means that you should not be impatient with them. They're saying, you should have already learned this. Well, maybe they should. But a wise head of the family encourages that and lets the dust settle so that encouragement can have its best advantage. Setting a time in which a meal will be taken together is a way in which you will set up a home environment which is um, friendly to spiritual growth. So, as a parent or as a father, set a time. Maybe it's going to be 6 p.m. every day. And, well, maybe your kids uh, go to swim team or maybe they're uh, on the debate team or they have some scheduling in that late afternoon uh, on the weekday. And so if, and my experience has shown me, that most practices after school are over by 6 or 6.30, the kids are home by 7, dinner could be at 7 p.m. Do not let the school dictate your schedule. Setting a time in which the family prays and sings together, that's your responsibility. You're the one who does this. If you are the mother in the home, if you are the mother in the home, you better support your husband because you are going to avoid future heartbreaks over your children. What are you going to do with your children leave home and they go in a sinful manner. They live their life in a sinful way. It's going to break your heart. Now, you support your husband and in the days to come, irrespective of how your children conduct their lives, you will know that you did the right thing. And then let her see as the head, you choose what church your children will attend. I know there are some of you who are saying, I thought that we should let our children choose. Are you kidding me? God gave you that responsibility. Setting up the altar declared Jacob's faith. His belief was directed to God, the mighty God of Israel. The Jewish religion is actually founded on the belief in the true God. Setting up the altar declares that this is the God who is going to be his family, and in this case it would be your family's object of worship. So these are the implications of setting up or building an altar. First of all, indicates who the head of the family is. Is it you? Are you going to set up an altar in your home? Obviously, it's not going to be building rocks or uh, setting up a, a fireplace, but you are the one who is the head over your wife, your children, and even if you have servants. Setting up of an altar declares your faith it defines your faith and in Jacob's uh, instance he built this altar and he named it God the mighty God of Israel he uses his new name because his life has changed and once again setting up the altar declares that this is the God who is going to be this family's object of worship. The name El Elohe Israel suggests that Jacob's God blessed him and kept him. And that would be during his journey to Padam Aram. And that's uh, when he left Canaan and uh, when he met his wife. During the 20 years that he was there working for wife number one, wife number two, and the flock. 
And now, also, during his return to the land of Canaan. So it suggests that this God, the El Elohe is Israel, is keeping him, blessing him, during his return to the land of Canaan. Okay, I need to, before we go to our next point, say this. If you're the father, you're the head of your family, you should be able to point back and say, in the history of this family, the Lord has blessed us when we did this. Maybe it was when we bought our first house. He has blessed us and kept us when the children were born. And when one of you were so sick that we had to take the, we thought we were going to lose you, and the Lord gave you back to us, that is something. And now, as a third point, you can say, the Lord is blessing us now, even when we are going through this very difficult situation in our life. He is blessing us now. Maybe one of your children is going to college. Maybe one of your children is going into the military service. Maybe one of your children uh, has died and the rest of the children are grieving. Even now, the Lord is blessing and keeping us. That is El Elohe Israel. Number five, it's a good idea for our children to hear your personal testimony. Now, there are those individuals who say, it isn't a good idea for you to give a testimony because when you do, it sounds like you're bragging. Well, maybe it does sound like you're bragging. But how old were you when you came to faith? That is, how old were you when you got saved? Your children need to know that. Your children need to know that you made a decision and that transferred you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. What special prayers did the Lord answer in your life? And what special deliverances has the Lord demonstrated or orchestrated in your life? Maybe you were terribly sick. You went into the hospital for surgery. They didn't give you a very good... Uh, chance to survive they gave you the odds uh, for you to survive you only have five percent chance but god brought you back to your family that is an answer to prayer that's a deliverance and then number six the world around you will know that you are a christian and may come to know christ because of your family witness there are people who live around you who need to know that Christ is your Savior. And they may come to know Christ as their Savior because your testimony is true. Let's go back to our outline before we call it a day. <clears throat> we are on letter B in the unmatched parentheses family. We've gone one in parentheses, two in parentheses, letter A, in parentheses, Genesis 33, Jacob builds an altar. And we have looked at <coughs> my, uh, Roman numeral in the minuscule number one. Uh, Jager, Yehuda, uh, Sehudza, Galid. Genesis 31, Peniel. Genesis 32, and then El Elohi. Israel, Genesis 33. We are now going to go to a second example, and that is Joshua 24, 14. Of the other points that you see in the outline, we will get to those soon enough. But now we need to look at Genesis 24, 14. And so let me introduce this. Genesis 24, 14 has those famous words, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let me introduce our passage. The narrative of the life of Joshua, the son of Nun, is divided into two parts. 
In each of these parts, Joshua held entirely different positions with regards to the people of Israel and discharged different duties. In the earlier period, he is the servant or the minister of Moses, loyal to his leader and one of his most trusted and valiant captains. After the death of Moses, he himself succeeds to the leadership of the armies of Israel and he conducts them, leads them to the settlement of the promised land. The service of his earlier years in life is a preparation and the equipment for the office and responsibility that devolved upon him in the later period. He had strong male leadership. And with that, we will close this morning. Thank you very much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 7.15 p.m. Thank you very much. And a word of explanation. We um, were not able to uh, stream the video of my face alongside of the, uh, uh, the presentation, uh, the slides. But uh, hopefully we will have this repaired by the next time. Thank you very much and have a great Sunday afternoon. May the Lord bless you and keep you.